Hello and welcome viewers. You are watching a program from the Digital Media Division of Fana Broadcasting Corporate. For now, I have a guest from New Zealand. He's Alistair Thompson, a journalist and geopolitical analyst who recently visited conflict-affected areas in Amhara and the far regions of Ethiopia. He will share his experiences in Ethiopia and comment on the current situation in the country in the light of the renewed belligerence by the TPLF group. Uh, thank you, Alistair Thompson, for joining us. Let's start from your recent experience in Ethiopia. I came to Ethiopia in April and stayed until June for eight weeks. I was originally planning on staying for three weeks, but stayed for longer, and visited um, Gonda and, um, and Afar regions and went to the front lines in both Gonda and Afar. So I went up quite close to the border with, with Tigray in Walkite and up to Abala in Afar. And in Afar, I saw the humanitarian situation, which was extremely dire. Um, I also saw the convoys that were going into Mekele. And at that stage, um, I arrived there, I think, in, in, early, in late May, um, so at that stage, the, the convoys were, were, were growing and getting larger and larger. And when I drove up to Abala, I saw a convoy that was, was headed up. I think it was about 108 trucks or something like that. Um, since then, they, they have expanded to around 300 trucks, some of the convoys. I saw um, aspects of the security that was around the convoys, um, which seemed to be kind of thin. Um, and I visited IDP camps or an, an IDP camp in in um, in Afar at Dubti, which was not an official IDP camp because it hadn't been approved by the National Emergency Risk Management Organization, and nor had it been approved by the by the UN agencies. So as a result of that, it was in pretty pretty bad shape. Um, there was sort of stagnant water all around the camp. Um, the residents of the camp were getting 25 litres per family per day of water, which wasn't nearly enough. Um, the doctors nearby at the Dubti Hospital were very concerned about a measles outbreak and there was large numbers of children dying. There was two or three children dying every day. So it was in, it was in, it was in very bad shape. Now, since, since then, I understand things have, have improved a little bit in that camp, but the humanitarian situation in Afar is, is pretty dreadful. And... There's large numbers of, at that stage, and there was large, large numbers of convoys carrying, carrying vast amounts of, of aid material into Tigray coming past them every day. And they got to Arebti. Um, the Afar pastoralist warriors essentially fought them back and eventually pushed them, pushed them back into, into, um, into Tigray. And um, for that first sort of December, January, February, March um, period, and even into April, I think, because I think they finally withdrew from Abala towards the end of April, the TPLF, that is. Um, the road was blocked because there was a war, essentially. I mean, they, they invaded the region. They displaced about 700,000 to a million people, depending on, on, on how, you, how you try to measure it, for the second time, because they'd already been displaced in the, in the first in the war between July and December as well. So, I mean, and we've, see, we've seen the same events sort of restarting now with this fifth initiation of conflict by the, by the TPLF. This time they seem to have invaded Yellow, which is a, which is a region which is further south. Um, uh, but, but sort of, yeah, further south, more close, closer to sort of Kobo. And they, on the 24th, according to the, my Afar sources, they, they shelled the town and killed a bunch of people there on the day that the, this latest conflict started. Do you believe uh, that the humanitarian uh, assistance was, was directly uh, just reaching uh, the people in need uh, in uh, Tigray? Uh, what's your comment on that? Well, I don't think we know what was happening inside Tigray. We, we have a bunch of reports, including the excellent research of Professor Anne Fitzgerald. And what that says is that um, 
all of virtually all of the witnesses that she spoke to, and she spoke to 162, said that when aid arrives in Michele, it is essentially taken control of TPLF, and they then distribute it, and they 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 make the decisions about who gets who gets aid and who doesn't get aid, and that if you if families were unwilling to provide soldiers for the fight, um, then they wouldn't get aid. And there's just recently been a report from from um, from Niamen Zalike, who's who's basically says, um, and I think he's got quite good sources um, in the government that there was there's 150,000 fighters in this current offensive, and I mean those those soldiers, new soldiers, had to be recruited because a lot of soldiers were lost in the in the last war. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think that the humanitarian operations in in um, in Michele have been as orderly as the UN has suggested they are, and the revelation that they stole twelve tankers of fuel, which was announced on the day the war started by the UN, um, was a shocking a shocking reminder of of exactly what's happened. I mean, in the first in the first round of the war, the the war between July and December, there was about a thousand, maybe fourteen hundred, maybe more trucks were used. UN trucks were used in the actual conflict. Um, and no doubt aid and food aid as well. And they looted fuel and aid and just about everything during that offensive as well. So, I mean, yeah. Uh, the government has repeatedly uh, vowed uh, to stick to the eu uh, peace talks to resolve the situation. And uh, even uh, the government of Ethiopia has uh, established uh, a main uh, peace talks uh, committee and uh, this uh, committee just uh, presented its uh, report uh, on on the progress uh, even uh, several international bodies were appreciating this uh, peace efforts how, how how do you see that what's your comment on that i think the government has done everything that it can to try to um, get agreement for there to be peace talks. Um, and then in June, um, the, the TPLF basically decided that they didn't really want to go ahead with the talks. And they said, well, the talks can't be held under the AU. They have to be held in Kenya under, under President Uhuru Kenyatta um, as the mediator rather than Obasanjo from Nigeria and who's the appointed mediator. And um, that was sort of the first indication that the TPLF was unwilling to actually participate in, in the negotiations. And they, they then, after that, they spent several, a couple of months basically talking about their conditions, which in, include the, res the restoration of services and, the, and, the, um, and receiving and, and basically um, a withdrawal from, from Walkite um, and basically demanding a whole lot of a lot of preconditions um and then we saw at the end of july um international envoys all arriving in 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 um in addis because it looked as though the peace talks were finally going to to get off the ground again there's another possibility of them starting and there was quite big talks that took place between the envoys and the government and the envoys in Michele, um, where unfortunately the envoys chose to to take selfies with with the TPLF leadership, which I think caused a lot of people a lot of concern that perhaps they weren't taking things seriously. After that visit, they issued a statement saying that they agreed that there should be a restoration of services, but the restoration of the services is not as easy as as um, as people people think and as you say the peace committee came out a, a couple of weeks later and said that um that in order for there to be a restoration of services first there needed to be talks and those talks needed to conclude an actual ceasefire so one of the things that most of the international communities appear to be un unaware of is the fact that there have been i think four unilateral ceasefires, or at least three anyway. There was one in June, and then there was one in December, and then there was one in March. Um, 
unilateral ones announced by the government, and none of those ceasefires were ever actually acknowledged by the TPLF. And only one of those ceasefires, the March one, was there a reasonable period of observance of it. And during that period, so from from April through to, to just recently, there has been a constant flow of aid into, into Tigray as a result of the fact that there finally was something which looked like a ceasefire. It wasn't an actual ceasefire because they never, they had never actually acknowledged it. They hadn't declared a ceasefire themselves. They just, they just basically agreed, agreed, I think, not to, not to, to, to do further invasions for a while, but it didn't last very long. Thank you.